Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld. You're watching Back to the Bible Canada, and we are talking about having the time of your life. We're talking about the, the issue of time. And today, I really want to talk about being careful how we walk. So let me read to you a quote. It comes from a man by the name of Donald Hall, and here's what he writes. For weeks after my last operation, that was for cancer. Frail and without energy, sleeping 10 hours, I looked in my house at all the books I had not read and wept for my inability to read them. Or I looked at great books I had read too quickly in my eagerness, telling myself I would return to them later. There is never a later, he writes. But for those, for, I'm sorry, but for most of my life, I have believed in a later. That's an interesting perspective. Now listen to the Roman philosopher Seneca, and here again is another quote. Seneca wrote, we are always complaining that our days are few and yet acting as though there were no end of them. (laughs) You know, we're we're talking about, you know, uh, how we use time and uh, so how to live our lives wisely, given that we have this limited amount of time, and given, as Paul writes, for the days are evil. So let me read the text of Scripture that I've been using as the basis for this series, and it comes from Ephesians 5, verses 5 to 17, which says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, we've all used the term wasting time. Um, and, uh, you know, wasting time it simply means I'm, I'm using my time for, for no good effect. But here we have this thing that says, watch carefully your use of time. Now, if you're going to use time well, you're going to have to become observant of the time that you're using. Now, that seems like it's obvious, but it's amazing to me how many people walk through life and never take the time to observe how am I actually using the time that I have every single day. You're gonna have to watch your time carefully. Now, I remember years ago, a lot of years ago, uh, my wife had a conversation. Our kids were still young, they were in our house, and my wife had a conversation with a woman Uh, Her and her husband and their family, uh, they were a very, very wealthy family. And and this woman wanted to have coffee with Kathy. And for some reason, you know, something was pressing on her and Kathy just wanted to hear her out. And the woman said to her, you know, what's it like? I want to know what's it like to live on a budget, she said. (laughs) So, you know, Kathy looked at her as if, you know, she'd just been, you know, hit blindsided, not knowing what in the world to say uh, to this woman. And when she got home, she said, I really didn't know what to say. And that led us to a conversation about, you know, about money. And uh, the woman said that, you know, she wanted to know what it was like to live on a on a budget because she had never in her life had to live on a budget, either in her parents' home or now in the marriage that she had. Now, so in our lives, you think about that. Uh, in our lives, I mean, budgeting, that was just a part of life. I mean, we didn't have, you know, a lot of money. We weren't poor, I'm going to say, but Uh, The definition of poor for me means that you don't have enough to take care of the basic necessities of life. And we did have enough for the basic necessities of life, but we didn't have a lot of excess. So we budgeted. So we were very careful around how we spent money. You don't ever want to spend money on something frivolous or foolish. We were very careful not to go into debt. Uh, we, We were planning constantly how to spend. So we would do things like, okay, Uh, The first 10%, that is our tithe. We give that to the Lord. And then we want to take some money, if we have any, to save up some for the future. Uh, But also money was, was tight. So we were asking ourselves, you know, always, how do you make a distinction between what we absolutely need and what we want? And so we, we listed things that we needed and what we wanted, and we would often talk about that. And, um, you know, it was our way of handling the resource that God had given us. And it was a limited amount of money, surely, next to the woman that, you know, that has, had asked my wife that question. So, but we did have a lot of conversations about that conversation. Um, what would it be like if the money was in unlimited supply, we would ask. So, well, one thing we said, well, we never have to comparison shop. Now, that was an interesting thought for us. Um, And then we also said, look, we never have to ever determine 
what's a need and what's a want. We never have had that conversation. Uh, we'd also never have to delay gratification. So, you know, for instance, uh, we would say, okay, we have this car and it's got so and so many kilometers on it. And we know that, you know, in the normal course of events, probably at this point in time, we're going to have to replace it. So we'd have a budget line so we wouldn't go into deep debt so that we'd already put money away into a car fund so that when the time came, we'd be able to afford a car. So we we're trying to be proactive in terms of money. But we said, like, we never have to do that. In fact, you know, if the, the, the car just that we had, you know, still had life left in it, and yet we were tired of it, well, we just get rid of it in a second, and we go get another one. We think, wow, that'd be a, that'd be a thought. And so there would be no rainy day fund. There would be no anticipation of future bills. We'd never have to worry about, you know, our house insurance and that kind of stuff that we'd have to pay in one lump sum. So all of that stuff, uh, we'd never have to do. So we thought, well, if we had all the money that we wanted, we said, well, then money, in a real way, would be off our radar screen. So what would that be like, we thought? Well, of course, I'm not talking about money. I I'm really talking about time, and I'm using this as an illustration of time. You see, some people are unaware of the passing of time, they're unaware that they're spending it. They're unaware that they have a limited resource in it. And so they act as if this is not an issue at all. They're not on a budget, shall we say. So how much time we got? So in essence, how we deal with time is, you know, really much the same as how we deal with money. If you think your money is an unlimited supply, uh, then you don't think it's such a precious commodity and you won't have to pay attention to it. Same with time. But if, on the other hand, you think that your supply of time is limited, then you're going to want to observe it carefully, and you're going to ask yourself, how am I spending this precious commodity, and is this use of my commodity wise? Now, go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, and notice that Paul uses the term or the verb, look. It's an action word, look. And then he attaches an adverb to that. He says, look carefully. In other words, be altogether diligent in your looking when you're walking through life. And of course, as you walk through life, you're spending on a regular basis. You're spending the increments of time that you have. And as you're doing that, says Paul, have a look at it, observe it, watch it with the greatest diligence that you possibly can. Observe, take notice pay attention, examine, contemplate this stuff. So what can all that mean? You know, as Paul's saying, well, that you ought to keep a day timer, which marks out every second of your time. I don't think he's saying that, although <laughs> I've got to say to myself, it would be an interesting thing if we actually took time and, you know, and of a given day and we marked out every, I don't know, every, you know, 15 minutes or so and, you know, kept a track of how we used our time during that time. Although I'm not certain that we get at what Paul is interested in here, and I'll explain that in just a little while. But what he's asking us to do is observe how we are using up our time. Um, and, uh, you know, when I think about that, I, I, I think about my own dad. Um, dad was that way with money. Uh, after my dad had passed, I was going through some of his stuff, and I had noticed that he had this um, a book in which he kept track of every last penny that that man ever spent. I still remember he had one line item on one day and he had gone to a grocery store and he bought an apple just for himself, but he marked down, I don't know, it was 12 cents or whatever it was back in those days. I spent 12 cents on an apple and I need to take note of that. I just spent that frivolously. I mean, that was how my dad thought about, you know, his, his money. I, I've never been that detailed about it. But I don't think that's what Paul is wanting us to do when it comes to time. He's not asking us to track every incremental minute that goes by. So let's go back and let's see what he has in mind. So I'm going to read the wider context. So Ephesians 5, 8 to 12. He says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you're the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And then he adds, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. See, there's a use of time. Try to discern what pleases God. 
take no part, he writes, in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Bring it to light. Have a, you know, notice carefully what darkness looks like. And then he adds, for it is shameful even to speak of the things they do, that is, the children of darkness do, in secret. See, don't let yourself, he is saying, simply simply slide into the behavior patterns that you used to have. Now, you know, the Ephesian church, these were all new believers in Christ. They had heard the gospel. They had found out that Christ came to seek and save the lost. They'd repented of their sins. They'd entrusted their lives to Christ who died for them and was raised from the dead. And now they lived for the glory of God. So there was a, a, a great point of departure from the life that they once had to the life that they were now enjoying in Christ. So Paul is asking them, would you contrast those two events of your life, the life that you had when you were in darkness, the light, the life that you now have now that you're in light. So uh, let me try to explain that even further. This is happening in Ephesus. And Ephesus, you know, was an ancient city in the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, it was a city, first of all, that was filled with temples. Uh, and a part of what happened in those temples is those temples had a form of spirituality that was overwhelmingly sensuous. So, for instance, sacred temple prostitutes made up the religious life of a great many people. I remember visiting the ruins of Ephesus, which is you know one of the most remarkable archaeological sites in history. And uh, you know the guide that was taking us through the, the the ruins of Ephesus pointed out that on one side there was a massive library, and the other side of the street, uh, joined by a tunnel underneath, uh, was a brothel. And he said, so you can say to your wife, you know, honey, I'm going to the library, and you had a neat little thing to get to the brothel. And I later said to the group that I was with, I said, you know, you need to understand that in the ancient world at that time, you never told your wife, I'm going to the library. You told her, I'm going to the brothel. And that's the sensuality that existed. It was accepted as a part of everyone's lifestyle. Um, So having sex with a temple prostitute in ancient Ephesus, that was considered the height of spiritual experiences. Now, there are other things that happen in temples. Let me suggest some of them. Uh, There is, of course, a temple deity in each temple. That is a god or a goddess of that temple. Uh, And usually those gods and goddesses were fickle and they had to be appeased. So you never really knew how a god or a goddess would react to something. And that meant that all of life was, you know, an upheaval constantly. And you never knew where you stood with the gods or the goddesses. Also that you would go to the temple and you would pour out sacrifices to these various deities and you would pledge your allegiance to Rome and to Caesar as Lord. And, you know, your business life intersected with your spiritual life, intersected with your civic life. I mean, everything was bound up together. And Paul is hinting at a pattern. He says, do you remember what life was like for you in those days? Um, And in Ephesians 4.19, Paul mentions the walk of the Gentiles. Listen to what he says. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, it's fascinating because, you know, in Ephesians 5, 3, and 4, he mentions the word sexual immorality. And the Greek word for that is the word porneia. Uh, We get our English word pornography from that. But porneia doesn't mean pornography. Porneia meant any sexual practice outside of heterosexual marriage. In other words, Paul says, outside of heterosexual marriage, every other form of sexual practice is is considered an act of rebellion against the God who made you. It's darkness, he says. And so there are thousands of forms of this sensuality in Ephesus, and you could pick your poison. You could go in any direction you want to, but Paul gives it one label in which he you know, just says, this is called darkness. Now, it, Paul says something else. Before you came to Christ, these were the patterns, he said, that marked your life. Now think about that and think about who you were then and think about the life that you left behind. How are you going to use your time in the future now that your life has moved from here to over here? What happens then? And then surprisingly, in the same passage, Paul mentions another word. He uses covetousness or greediness, covetousness. Now, why would he mention 
covetousness right alongside of this list of sensual practices? And the answer is, first of all, because the Tenth Commandment is the commandment you shall not covet. And then it names the number of things that you would covet. You would covet, you know, your your neighbor's ox or his donkey or his farmhouse or his land or his money, but you might also covet your neighbor's wife, says the command. So if you're not satisfied with your marriage, you're not satisfied with your spouse, you look across the fence at your neighbor and says, that guy's got a better wife than I've got. Or, you know, in that matter, you know, a woman can do the same. She can look at, you know, another woman's husband and say, you know, she's got a man. I wish I had a man like her man. So that's called covetousness. That's looking at something you don't have and, oh man, you wish you had it. So covetousness takes a number of forms. I mean, you can be unsatisfied with your finances. Uh, You can be dissatisfied with your living conditions. You know, boy, you wish you had a nicer house uh, than other people seem to have. And and then you might be dissatisfied with your health. You're dissatisfied with your job. You know what? You know what a rotten job I've got. Other people have better jobs. Uh, You're dissatisfied, you know, with the weather. I mean, I happen to live on the west coast of British Columbia, Canada, and, uh, you know, the weather here is it rains all the time. And you can say, I know of other places where it's sunny a lot of the time if I only lived there rather than, you know, in this rotten weather constantly. So there's, there's a hundred thousand different reasons why we can be dissatisfied with our lives. Now, keep all of that in mind, and let me quote to you from French philosopher Blaise Pascal. He said, all men are deeply unhappy. And he knew why we were all unhappy. He said, because universally, all human beings, got this, complain. Yeah, all human beings complain. And Paul, writing to the Ephesians, says, that was your life before you came to Christ. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, he mentions other things that come, you know, apart from, you know, the sensuality and the covetousness. He mentions crude talk and coarse joking because, you know, the kind of talk that you have just filters, it's just a filter from everything else that you feel about life. So cursing becomes a part of that. Now, contrast that, that previous life to what you have now in Christ And Paul will use one word that summarizes the life in Christ. And you ready for it? Here's the word, thanksgiving. (laughs) Yes, thanksgiving, deep thankfulness. When you came into the light and out of the darkness, your dissatisfaction with life was replaced by gratefulness to God who loved you, who sent his son, who cleansed you from your sin who adopted you into his family, who is now watching over your life and arranging all of the events in your life to maximize your joy in eternity. So whatever you're going through, you can be thankful because it comes from the hand of a God who loves you. And so the crude language, you know, the coarse talk that used to be a part of your life now got replaced with what kind of things? Well, worship, adoration, joy, abundant thankfulness, that becomes your life now. So the, the point is, remember how you used to spend your time? Yeah, you remember those, those old days. Do you want them back? <laughs> now there's a thought. Would you like to have them back? And to which all of the Ephesian believers would have said, uh, as a matter of fact, no, we don't want those days back. We're so grateful for the new life that God has given us. And by the way, if you don't know Christ, see, that's what you're missing. This understanding that God loves you and is invested in you to the point that he uses all of your circumstances for your long-term good. I mean, it's incredible that he has saved us out of darkness and into light. He can do that for you if you give your life to Christ. So there's the marked contrast and the profound emptiness that you used to have compared with the fullness of gratefulness and the abundant joy that you now have. So, so don't you know that there, that makes a difference in terms of how you spend your time? So, so watch now. You know, for our purposes, let's make application and, and think about it this way. Think about the kinds of things that people plan for their future. That has to do with time. So some people will say, okay, I'm, I'm young and I'm looking for the best possible future, so I'm going to get all of the education that I can. Well, that's good. Other people will say, you know, I'm 
you know, I'm 15, 25 pounds overweight. I got to lose that weight. I'll be more healthy. I'll look better. I'm planning for that and I'm making all the, you know, changes I need to do. Uh, other people will say, you know, what I really want out of life is I want to travel. I want to see the world and uh, I'm going to make sure that happens. Other people will say, I just want to accumulate wealth. Other people will say, you know, I, I want a better house and better whatever. I want to live in greater luxury than I now have. So there are a lot of things that people plan for their lives and they want to use their time, the increments of time that they've been given to get those things. Now, please hear what I'm saying. I I'm not denouncing any of that. But often, would you notice how often whatever future goals that we have so that we say, I'm going to use my time to get this goal, how many times the future goals are driven by dissatisfaction? I am unhappy now, and if I had that in the future, that unhappiness would go away. So what we often don't realize is that when we get that, that deeply ungrateful spirit that we have gets just transferred to a new situation. For the first short period of time, we're so glad, you know, we got this new thing. And then given enough time, the, the, the shine wears off. And then we soon find ourselves grumping and complaining just like we used to. See, life change without a heart change is never the answer that we're looking for. So, so we carry this discontented spirit into all areas and we find out, you know, I got everything I ever wanted and I'm still as empty as I've ever been before. That's not an uncommon complaint. It is so common to the nature of human experience. So let me tell you a little story. Um, you know, I ride a motorcycle. I love motorcycle riding. It's kind of my hobby. And, uh, and it was a beautiful, warm summer day and I had ridden my motorcycle to the ocean side uh, to a coffee shop. I had parked it in a parking stall, uh, paid for my stall. I went inside, got a cup of coffee. I had a beautiful book I was gonna read and just gonna spend this wonderful day looking out over the ocean, reading a book with a coffee in my hand. Ideal, I was gonna spend that day in luxury. Well, I hardly sat down and there was a guy that pulled up with a bike next to me and you know, a motorcycle doesn't take up a, a whole slot for you know, that a car would take. And so he asked, you know, can I park my bike next to yours in the slot? And I said, absolutely. I mean, after all, it's, it's free. I already paid for it. You might as well have a part of it. And so he went inside and uh, brought out a cup of coffee, sat down beside me. We started to talk. And uh, he said to me, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just such a beautiful day to ride a bike today. And I said, absolutely. And uh, he said, you know, you only go around once and you got to grab it when you can. Well, that's an interesting thing because I knew what he was talking about. He was talking about the wisest use of time. What's the best use of time that he could possibly have? And here's what I told him. I said, I, I think you mean to say that because we have a limited amount of days and we will soon die, the best use of our time is to ride motorcycles. <laughs> and he said, yes, <laughs> he was right on to that, absolutely. And he wanted me to say yes as well. And I said to him, well, as a matter of fact, I do enjoy riding my motorcycle, but I said, listen, the wisest use of our time are to do those things that prepare us for eternity. And he looked at me as if I just hit him over the head with a brick. And uh, so, you know, but that started a conversation, uh, but not long. He finally got up and said, I, I've had it with this, but I, I was hoping that this would lead us to an encounter about what's time all about and what is the wisest use of time? Because if I've ridden my motorcycle as much as I can, will I then be content at the far end of life? I don't think so. See, uh, there's, there's an investment into eternity I might have missed. And Paul is not asking us now to, you know, to take out our day timer and to ask ourselves, what's the best use of every single second? He's rather saying, look carefully how you walk. He says, don't, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. You know, if we're not, if we don't use time well, and we're not observant as to how we use time, you know, we will fall into evil practices. So Paul says, look carefully. Now, notice he uses the word walk, which gives you the sense that we're all on a journey. We're walking somewhere. We're going somewhere. So 
you know, he's using this example that life itself is a journey, and it is. It's fascinating because when you read through the book of Ephesians, you find out that there are five occasions in the book where Paul uses the term walk. Uh, Let me give you the first time he uses it, and it's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. He says, before you knew Christ, he says, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So you walked in deadness. You know, it's kind of like, you know, one of those old zombie movies. Oh, well, maybe they're not so old. I, I understand there's still a lot of them going on. I've always wondered, by the way, about zombie movies. I mean, why in the world would someone be interested in watching a movie in which it seems like the sum total of the plot is shooting one zombie in the head after the other? I, I, you know, somebody's got to do a psychology paper on what's actually going on in people's minds when they, you know, when they see that and, you know, why that fascinates and even entertains them. Um, I'm getting off track. Uh, Imagine, however, the the zombie movie. Paul is saying, look, you were walking in trespasses and sins. Um, And, and, but he doesn't say you were just walking in them. He says, you were dead in them. You were walking in death. Now, Paul is not saying that we were physically dead like a zombie uh, because he knows that we're very much alive. And, and there's so much life inside of us. After all, we're made in the image of God. We have an intellect that we're using, and a number of people use it Im- remarkably well. We have an imagination which, if we use that well, will lead us to creativity. Uh, we have this ability to carry on relationships, and some of them bring delight to our hearts. We have ability to love. We have ability to hate. We have ability to destroy. We have ability to create. Uh, All of us are alive. We're alive to the world in which we live. We're alive to that, but being alive to the world in which we live, Paul says, however, we're dead in sins and trespasses. You know what a trespass is? You ever get to a piece of property, it says, you know, uh, do not trespass. It means that there's a boundary here and you're not allowed to cross that boundary. And God has set out boundaries which are his revealed will, his law. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Uh, you shall not. Um, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet what your neighbor has. These are all laws that God has given. But we're walking in death because we're trespassing over God's laws. So here's the important thing: Yes, we're alive in a great many ways, but we're dead in our relationship to God. People walk through life a world that God has created a world in which we're accountable to God, a world in which we will soon die and have to stand before God and give an account for our lives, and we're dead to that reality. See, that's what what Paul is saying. That's what it's like to walk in death. You progress throughout your life in this deadness towards God, and the longer you go through life, the, the greater becomes your disattachment from God and your attachment to the things that, that bring shame to your life. You're attached to the world, the, the flesh and the devil, and it makes progress and you sink ever deeper into a life that's so distant from God. Now, okay, so let's take another use of the word walk, the second use of the word walk, and this one is found in Ephesians 2 verse 10. And there's the contrast for believers. Watch this, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is, we should progress in good works. So let me kind of bring all of this together. What does it mean to live wisely, walk wisely, to use your time wisely? So let me give you a sense of how a great many lives of a great many people seem repetitive and meaningless. Um, so it goes like this. Um, your alarm wakens you at 5.30 a.m., 6 a.m., whatever time it is. You go to the bathroom. You shave. You shower. Then you eat breakfast. You brush your teeth. You get into your car. You commute to work or to school. Uh, and then you get home. And then you have supper. And you watch television. And then you fall asleep. And then you repeat the same formula another four times. And then you take a two-day retreat from that. And then you go right back to it five times again. And so it seems like I'm wasting my life on this repetitive journey. But I can't get off, you know, this, this, this 
rep- rep- repetition in life because um, I, I got to have the money and what else am I going to do? And so life seems meaningless and the seconds of your time and the minutes and the hours and the days and the weeks and the months seem to just drift by and it all seems like a waste and I'm getting nowhere and we tend to panic. Deeply discontent about what we see happening, we try to distract ourselves with the pleasures of life and they work for a moment but the deep emptiness remains. Paul says that's called walking in death. That's using your time unwisely. You should look at that use of time and it should awaken you and say, everything that tells me right now that the journey through life that I'm on is the most unwise use of time. See, that's the conclusion that we come to. Now, I'm not saying that if you're a believer, um, you don't have a repetition in your life as well. You know, the alarm clock wakes you, you go to the bathroom, you shave, shower, do all the other stuff, go to work, come home, and uh, finally go to bed and then repeat again four more times. You know that you do that, but in each day, you can see the goodness of God. You can, in your work, say, I'm not just doing this to please my employer, I'm doing this to please God because in this work, I am bringing goodness to the human race for the glory of God. Uh, We might say of myself also, in each day, I look for those opportunities that God gives me to grow in my faith, to encounter people that I might be able to impact. I see opportunities that the Holy Spirit brings to my life in this regular repetition of life. And I see, as I go through these repetitions, I see deepening sense of God's presence and of His deep love for me. And I'm so grateful that God has given me the life that I am now living, for in everything I see his hand. See, that's what Paul says. You want to make sure that when you live out your life, when you walk through and progress in life, that you want to be progressing in the light of the glory of God. And when you do that, he says, you'll be making the very best use of the time. You know how evil the days are, but you also know that when you walk in the light, the time that you use will benefit you greatly and will lead you to the best possible eternity. See, that's the wonderful promise that we have. You know, time can be our friend if it is given to the glory of God and it is seasoned with thankfulness. Hey, I'm thankful that you watched today. May the Lord bless you on this day, and may he give you much grace to be thankful in all things. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.